Hello and welcome. This is a podcast explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org, a website in English uh, about Ukraine. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm chief editor of ukraineworld.org. I'm very pleased to greet Peter Pomerantsev, famous book author and senior fellow at Johns Hopkins University. Hello, Peter. Hello. Thanks so much for joining this podcast. We are now in Kyiv. You you have uh, you have come here for uh, journalism work, for information work. And uh You you are you have traveled already since 24th of February several times to Ukraine is it correct? Yeah, I think it's maybe my my fourth or f- fourth visit. You you've written several texts about I remember your text about Yahidna the the, the village in Chernihiv Oblast in which uh, people were uh were put into the underground. Uh so when you're coming to Ukraine and when you're trying to understand what is happening, what what strikes you in the way how Russian army behaves in, U- in the way how Ukrainian behave those people who are witnessing Russian uh, occupation. In in Yakhidna, I was very struck by something a local grandmother Valentina told me. So you're quite right. In Yakhidna, um, 300 villagers were forced into a cellar. Ten died. Um, supposedly for their protection. Meanwhile, around the whole village, gangs largely of Tuvan soldiers, soldiers from Tuva, uh, it's an Asiatic minority in Siberia, roamed around, you know, trashing things, looting, often sort of just sleeping where where animals sleep, like in the in the sheds on on straw. And she was very struck by this. And at one point she asked a Russian soldier, ethnic Russian, What what are you doing here? Why are you here? And he said, well, we want you to be with us. And this phrase, with us, intrigues me. What do we mean to be with us? What is it that, that Russia wants Ukraine to be with? I mean, we can all see that this is openly an empire-building project. Putin talks about it that way, how he wants to repeat Peter the Great's conquests. But what sort of empire is it? You know, is it an ideological empire? Uh, some other sort of empire? What is it that the Russians are trying to create? And what do they want people to be part of? And, and the more you, you dig into this question, and I think this is both indicative in the behavior of Russian soldiers, but also in the propaganda that Russia spreads. And, and the conclusion I've sort of come to that this isn't really an empire in any clear ideological sense. But it's an empire based on an empire of humiliation. When Russia says they want others to be with them, they want others to be brought into and trapped into the cycle of humiliation and aggression, of endless sadomasochism that Russia practices internally and almost wants to bring others into. So be with us means actually be under us. So there is just a small difference of words, prepositions. But it's more than that because the Russians do because that's that's the classic empire, you know, where where but 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 what But makes, under us I mean not in a political sense of the word, but in a sadomasochistic or even sexual sen- sense of the word. And be trapped in the whole cycle. I mean it's it's almost as if Russia wants to drag Ukraine back into into the sort of really messed up performance of, of Russia's agonies. I mean, think about what Russia does when it comes here. It starts recreating stuff from the Soviet Union. So the LNR and DNR recreated sort of the Soviet Union with its bizarre, you know, pseudo youth groups and um, sort of celebration of, of Soviet horrors. Um, it comes back to Ukraine and sort of like repeats, you know, something that it did in, in Soviet times, sort of the execution of intelligentsia, using hunger as a weapon. Um, but what makes Russia different from other empires? I mean, whether it's the Nazis or, or, or the English Empire, for example, the British Empire, you know, that there was a clear sort of superior class, the British, and they were trying to bring enlightenment and terror to to the countries under them. But But the British to themselves were quite self-respectful. If you were British within the system, you you were privileged. While in Russia, 
even most Russians are humiliated by the system. I mean, it's not a, uh, it's been called a self-colonizing culture, which can mean different things, but it can also mean that Russians also um, have no rights in this culture. So they might have more rights than anyone else, but they still have no rights, or very few rights. Um, and I think, I think that's what makes the, the Russian imperial project so unique. And, and you see that in the way they treat their own soldiers. I mean, the Russians commit, commit casual war crimes to Ukrainians, but then the way they treat their own soldiers is also deeply humiliating. They just leave their carcasses out to rot. Um, they use them as a cannon fodder. Nobody expects the soldiers to have rights. It's why these stories about, oh, the Russian army is treating Russian soldiers badly. They don't resonate in Russia because people expect Russian soldiers to be treated like dirt. Um, and it's as if the Russians want to bring everybody into this cycle of humiliation. The way they humiliate their own people, they want to humiliate others, you know, to compensate for that humiliation, but also to sort of keep them trapped inside the nightmare of the past. Um, when psychoanalysts talk about humiliated people and their, and their problems, they always say how humiliated people struggle with an idea of the future because they cannot get over the past, so they're constantly playing out the traumas of their past, often in sadomasochistic ways. So a way to deal with being humiliated is to start enjoying it. And that's a large part of where masochism comes from. So, um, yeah. so, so you are saying that, and it's, it really resonates, my, my thinking about that, is that the, the, the violence... It's so deep in the Russian society that basically every citizen is a kind of a masochistic subject, right? And you are not you are not free from from this violence. I think it was brilliantly described back in 19th century by by Astol de Justine. If you read him, uh, his Russia's in uh, Russia in 1839, his book, then he describes something which which surprised me is that in Russia there is only one boss. And then every, even the highest aristocrat is treated as the lowest peasant by this boss, by this Tsar. I mean, this is the amazing thing about sort of Russian oligarchs and tycoons. I mean, they're not really oligarchs. There are no oligarchs in Russia anymore. There's, there's tycoons. And, and even they feel insecure. Even they know anything can be taken away from them. And so you have this very paranoid, very rich class who are into all this stupid stuff like shamanism and mysticism and horoscopes and superstition to have some sort of control over their environment. Because you're quite right. Just like in de Custine's time, any, any tycoon can have everything taken away from him at any moment. And I think it starts very early. I think what's interesting about Putin is that he's both sort of, you know, the boss, but also very much a product of it. I mean, he's so, just his stories about his own childhood are full of humiliation of growing up in a communal apartment, the poverty of it. Just growing up in a communal apartment is the most humiliating thing that can ever happen to you. You have no privacy. Going to the toilet is just this humiliating experience. And toilets are a big theme in, 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 Russian, in the Russian imagination and, and Russian behavior here. Um, so, and I think Putin's power, though, in terms of the essence of his propaganda power, is, is that he's learned to play both sides of the humiliation performance. If you listen to him, he's either humiliated by the world, by the West, just abusingly, just humiliated and insulted. And he expresses a lot of Russians' humiliation and sense of insult. And then the next moment, he's doling out humiliation to others. So he's both the sadist and the masochist in in, in, his, in, in his performances. So you think that in this Russian sadism, the key thing, the key feeling is a masochism. So the feeling that you are... It goes round and round and round. You, you're the masochist, then you're the sadist. You're the masochist, then you're the sadist. And, and the only way for you to not to become masochist, not, not to be suffering, is either to continue this violence on others or to identify yourself with the subject that is committing violence on you and can commit uh, violence on others. I mean, that's, that's the most famous thing. People who are humiliated will then try to take it out on others, and that clearly is happening. But also, listen to the sort of propaganda that the Russians are doing inside the country. They're basically saying, yeah, things are going to be tough. You're going to suffer, but we're tough. Almost like we enjoy suffering. I mean, it's a very cruel trick. The Kremlin has made its own population suffer for centuries without ever 
apologizing. I mean, there's no public memorials to the gulag or anything. You know, it's just like, you know, Stalin's an effective manager. The, the Kremlin has been the agent of causing others to suffer. As a response, many Russians have taken on masochism as a way to deal with that. That's one of the few ways to deal with suffering is to start to enjoy it. And now the Kremlin is saying, well, you're going to suffer again, but you enjoy that, don't you? And Russians do respond and say, yeah, we're going to love these sanctions. We're going to tough it out. Because one of the few ways a victim can make sense of himself is by celebrating the victimhood. I think when, when the, the, the Western analysts, and you, you know this climate much better than me, when they try to analyze what is going on, they're trying to seek for the causes of this war, for reasons of this war. And uh, there is this uh, phrase that I adore, unprovoked military invasion. As if, if it were provoked, it will be justified and it will, will, would be okay. So... Uh, the NATO expansion is one of the things that is, is said as, as kind of uh, causes of it, etc. Well, when, when, when we follow your argument and, and our, our common like, reflection on this, I think that Russians were simply uncomfortable with this uh, world without the war. They were simply uncomfortable with the 90s, with the 2000s. They, they, they don't know how to behave in peace times. Therefore, when suddenly there, is, there wasn't this opportunity to have a war, they suddenly realized that this is their kind of reality. Is that true? We'd have to go much deeper into it. I, I mean, at the same time, they're not admitting that there's a war. Um, I think I'd love to do more research to, see how many think that this is going to blow over quickly and you know for the moment you're still not allowed to, to use the, the word war so I don't, I don't know I know what you mean that that there's something the one I suppose ability that Russians have built up is to respond to extreme situations simply because the history is extreme and, and there might be something in that. But also, look, I would actually question Russians' resilience. So their pride is, we've always been victims of Stalin, of the Rothschilds, whoever. We're good, at, we're good at this. You know, we're tough. I think it's nonsense. I think it's absolute nonsense. They're not tough. They just die. They're not resilient. They just get crushed. This is the difference between true resilience and true strength when you go and overthrow the government as sort of Ukrainians do. Ukrainians have been shown to be very resilient. Resilience is when you don't change, when you take the hit and then you survive and you push back. That's resilience. Russians aren't resilient. They just die. They just die en masse or they get broken en masse. So their masochism is actually fragility. The masochism is how they explain away the fact that they're actually just broken. So they might celebrate it at some level, but it's a very thin performance, a very thin performance. And I think they're incredibly vulnerable. I don't think they're genuinely resilient. I think this is the self-myth of the victim. And I don't think we should fall for it. When we describe this war, we see the pattern uh, which is going on uh, from the Second World War and even before that uh, Russians are really trying to take Ukraine by uh, qu quantity the number of people, and you say they are, they are leaving their soldiers uh, without taking them, that don't really care about the number of, 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 of victims, of their casualties. Ukrainians report already about almost uh, 40,000 40, people. Well, at least there are several dozens of thousands of people. The Russians don't, don't seem to care. Do you think that, that that is also the way how they are waging this war? It looks like it. It looks like it and distance as well. The moment they got up close, they didn't do well. You know, there's like, the moment they had to look Ukrainians in the eye, they didn't do well, you know, in these, these, sort, of com in these sort of battles at the start. And now it's just distance. It's the pounding of artillery from far away. I mean, there's a dehumanized element to that already. They don't want to sort of like, they both send their troops not ca caring about the casualties and the use of mass artillery is also, there's a distance to it. There's a unhuman way of war in some ways um they seem more comfortable with that you know but if we describe this climate of russian political culture whatever is there any way out do you th do you see because there is a big discussion if there is another russia uh, and by another russia i think some of the western governments misleadingly perceive 
well, just some of the opposition staff, opposition leaders, people who uh, left Russia. But my question is whether there is another concept of Russia, whether there is another concept of uh, political organization of Russia, which would uh, go away from this vertical society in which you are either dominated or, or dominating. Do you think there is something possible? There's always something possible. I mean, you know, this is what people said about Germany, that it could only be this way. They said it's about Spain, that could only be dictatorial. They said this about Japan, that it could only be dictatorial. We, we've, we've heard this sort of cliche many times. The, the fact is, though, that change usually happens either after a crushing defeat, in the case of Germany and Japan, de facto colonization for a while, for a while, not now, but for a while. Um, Spain evolved differently. But we have plenty of experiences historically of cultures that were dismissed as Im unable to do democracy, but they did change. But they had to go through a lot of self-recognition and some very, very big breaks in their history. I think at the, but that's a very philosophical question, and I don't think it's an important question during a war. It's an important question in the whole history of things. But all that matters now is winning this war and... Um, and breaking this regime. Now, to break this regime, you don't need this huge change. You just have to, you know, you just have to make, you just have to impel Russian decision makers to change their political calculation. And the danger in the West is that it becomes, it's either Putin or the complete collapse of Russia, which scares a lot of people because of where do the nuclear weapons go? That's the position since 1993. And I think we don't need to get stuck into this, into this binary. There's so many other stages of things that will ensure that Russia changes political direction, that war criminals are given up, that many, many other things happen, which would, for the moment, at least signify victory in this war. But still there is a question, okay, you change the regime, the, the regime collapse, imagine this utopian scenario, but, but then, the, the, yeah. then the, the, the relations between the people, we are talking about like deep uh, pattern of relations between the people, and uh, the, question, the question is for me, for example, that, okay, Germany, but in Germany you have a big liberal tradition b b before Nazis. You have Immanuel Kant, you have uh, Goethe, you have whatever you, whatever you want. You, you had the decentralized medieval empire in which cities had autonomy, etc. Well, my, my fear is that Russians suddenly understand that they, are, they have no, nothing to, to be based upon in terms of alternative tradition. The only political traditions they have is the Tsarism empire and that's it. So how to deal with that? Well, so, I mean, the English had the same thing. We only had a tradition of, of empire as well. Um, and we're adapting pretty badly since then. But, but we're not, you know, we, 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 we don't sort of take, out, take it out onto our neighbors. Um, I think you, you, you started from a nation state and then oh, you built a, well, an empire. I'll talk to Tim Snyder about that. Anyway, <laughs> but um, uh, I don't understand the question you're asking. Yes, that's obviously true. So you're asking a philosophical question about what is Russia? Or are we talking about how to win this war? Um, you know, how to win this war is to change the political calculation in Russia, get a sort of breather where Russia goes through one of its periods of slightly thinking about its future. And in the meanwhile, Ukraine becomes armed to the teeth and joins genuine alliances, which will make sure that it's never invaded again. That's the way out of this war. If we wanted to get into a philosophical discussion about what is Russia and can it be something else? I mean, that's fascinating, but I mean, fine. I mean... We'll know, I'll tell you what, we'll know when it's happened, when the Kremlin is a museum and the mausoleum is gone. That'll be a moment. That'll be a moment when they say, okay, our tradition up till now is wedded to a horrific tradition of not just any old empire building. All empires are awful, but an empire of, of humiliation and, and sadism. And we are now going to turn the Kremlin into a museum of occupation and horror. The mausoleum goes. And we can think of two or three other indicators that would tell us that Russia has become different. Uh, but, you know, that's not my concern right now. But I will tell you why I'm asking this question, a philosophical question, not because I'm a philosopher, maybe, but because what Ukrainians are fearing is that this violence is not just violence, this is repeated violence. 
this is violence which is going on on and on yeah but sure but and they, uh, but and take, and they, yeah. yeah and and the problem is that this violence, for example, it can stem back from Stalinism, but Stalinism can stem back from uh, 19th century Russia. Uh, 19th century Russia can can stem back from, uh, I don't know, Peter Peter the First, etc. And the problem is, is that if you change the regime, okay, every 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 century you have the change in, of regime in Russia, and you have Westernizers. Peter the First is a Westernizer. Alexander I is a westernizer, Bolsheviks are westernizer, and even Yeltsin and Putin are westernizers. And the problem is, is that if you bring western ideas of democracy or whatever, of Marxism, or as Alexander brought the ideas of um, Masonism or whatever, if you don't change these uh, internal relations in, in Russia b between people, uh, you you will get the same thing. You will get another regime in ten years, which will mm. uh, attempt to build another empire. Well, not in ten years. You'll, you'll get it in two years. But inside those two years, you, we can try to. We need to ensure that Ukraine is as safe as Poland. So change. I don't know if it can change. I think the change might well come from the way sadomasochistic cultures go, which is to a point of self destruction. But what I'm worried about is winning this war well enough now. And for that, we don't need the whole change. We just need Putin to be replaced by Kirienko, a full apology for the, for the invasion, giving up of the 30 war criminals who were put on trial internationally, and war reparations. That's all we need. And while that happens, we ensure that Ukraine joins NATO and is as safe as Estonia and Poland. And Russia, we can think about changing it. I'm sure there's, there's Russians who will try to change it, but as big a chance is that the sadomasochism turns inwards. Uh, if you follow Russian propaganda, I think one of the messages that also kind of worries me is that it seems that some of them are even, even agree with the fact that Ukraine will join NATO, but the tiny part. This was, uh, this was clearly said, by, I think, by Simonian uh, just before, the, before this invasion, I think, last year or something. That, okay, Russia can agree that the tiny part of Ukraine, like Western Ukraine, maybe part of Central Ukraine, will join NATO. We don't care about it, but the rest is ours. And uh, when we think about this war, I'm thinking increasingly about the parallel with Poland, uh, the, the, the history of Poland, let's say, from the divisions of Poland until 1980, 1939, where the existence of Poland was a key factor for Central Europe. And when imperial countries like Russia, after Poland regained its independence after the, the First World War, wanted to divide Poland again, do you think that this is one of the, they're willing to divide Ukraine? Not yeah, to I mean, capture Ukraine maybe totally, but to divide it into several different parts. Yeah, they talk about it openly. Hmm? They talk about that openly as one of their options, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's not a secret. They were ready to divide it with Poland. <laughs> like that, we, we thought that it was a joke. I'm not sure that was a joke. <laughs> I think they meant it. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Ukraine. Uh, you're coming here. What what surprises are? Uh, what surprises you? There is probably a banality to say that okay, you have we, Ukrainians have a, a big civil society that is strong, that is getting stronger. But what what is, what is changing since 2014? Do you do you see changes? Since 2014, I see a lot of changes. But but do you mean right now? Since since February 24th? Or? Yes. Yes. Let's say Ukraine during the, the second Russian invasion compared to the first Russian invasion. Well, listen, I mean, we're in the middle of a war. And so all the focus on the war, I see a lot of psychological trauma at all levels of society. And I really worry about who's going to deal with that, whether it's kids who have been staying the night in the metro through to soldiers, through to just ordinary people, all of whom have been in incredible stress the last four months. And, and there's the levels of sort of trauma are very deep. And I... I it's very important that, that people work with that. That's what I see, and I see people grieving for their lost ones, and I see incredible unity and resilience, but there's huge costs which have to be dealt with. Um, so I see that. I, I, I suppose what's really changed is now the whole world knows about Ukraine, which is a new thing. And all our research before February 24th that you helped with 
Ukraine's always talking about like no one knows us. No, 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 this moment, will someone recognize us? Ukraine is now a name on everybody's lips. I just got back from, I was in England recently, and there's a Ukrainian flag on every village church. I mean, it's it's mind-blowing. And we need to think very carefully about why this happened and what it means, because there was sympathy for Syrians, there was sympathy for Kosovars. There's, you know, there's been lots of sympathy before for Bosnians in my lifetime, but not this sense of prichestia, that's the Russian word, the sense of actually being part of one process. Beyond empathy, it's, it's actually the sense of being a family. And I still haven't quite worked out how that happened. What was the miracle that made that happen? Because it's much stronger than sympathy and empathy. It's a real sense of connection and co-experience. Not everywhere, but in a lot of places. And I wonder, I'd love to know how Ukrainians feel the way that they are now so on the map of the world and, and a generator of meaning. <laughs> it's not just on periphery. People will go, wow, these people have taught us what democracy means. And you know, from almost not being in the global conversation to really being the place that articulates it is one of the most amazing transformations I've seen. But do you think it can change? Because we had the same experience in 2014, and then it disappeared. And then in 2018, we were struggling for attention again. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I don't think so. Uh, I don't think there was much awareness after 2014. I think it was like... Look, I'm I'm a bit troubled when, uh, when people say that Ukrainians are teaching democracy others. Because on the, on the one hand, it is true, because Ukrainians are fighting for values. Values are uh, considered to be under danger. You are in the existential fight. This is, I mean, I'm describing what is happening with the Hamletian question, to be or not to be. Everybody knows this question, but uh, it is only now that I probably understand it. But on the other hand, uh, being kind of... Uh, f- in other countries, what, what just n- f- fascinates me is that we got so many letters from all parts of the world. We got so, many, so much support. So imagine a person in Melbourne, in Australia, sending, sending some something, send, sending some support, etc. This is also shows about themselves, mm. not about us, mm. not only about us. So this, this sense of engagement, mm-hmm. it is also the work that these nations are doing, these citizens are doing, not only Ukrainians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that's, and that's what I'd love to understand more, how that happened. It's way beyond sympathy and empathy. There's a real, it's like, it's a bit like watching football, and I mean this in a good way, not in a bad way. When you watch football, the magic of football is that you feel that you're on the field with the players. You feel the players are an extension of your limbs. It's a very, very mystical thing. Like, you're there, and they are you. And even as an English person, but also talking to my English friends, when the English see their weapons being used here, it's as if we're there. And it's that level of connection. And I think, actually, it resonates through the metaphor of family, which is the metaphor that's being used over and over. And family is a long-term relationship. So I think if this can be developed properly, I think this is for a long time. But it has to be developed. I mean, there's potential to develop Look, it. If nobody works with it, it won't be forgotten, but it'll be lost. It, it's very interesting because I remember some 10 years ago when we, we saw the, the family metaphors applied on politics. And, for example, the Russians apply family meta, uh, metaphors on politics, saying, okay, you're younger sister, we are older brother, etc., we have been saying, look, family, family metaphors can, should not be applied to politics because politics is a, is a question of partnership, not even friendship. So you're partners, you're allies, but you're not part of the family. And now it seems what you're saying that we're so fed up with this kind of a dehumanized politics that we want to extend the family relations to something bigger. I, I, think, I think there's a reason. The Russians use it, but the Russian family is the really unhappy, abusive family that everybody wants to leave. And I think Ukraine will and is joining and is reminding Europe that it is a family as well. So we do the family metaphor can be evil or can be good. If we leave it purely as mutual interest and partnerships, then I'm actually not very hopeful because the mutual interest is quite thin. And 
that's not going to be a metaphor that, that defeats Russia. But that's interesting because, you know, we, ha- we have this mem in Ukraine, family values, and родинні uh, цінності, сімейні цінності. And it, it has been using, used by, by the far right mostly, by the conservatives. And my argument, I, I remember a few years ago, was that, look, why do liberals give away family values to conservatives? Don't we, don't we think that family values is the most liberal thing, probably? If, if, if the family, family is the place where you have a chance to have all your capacities developed, because you're, if, a, if it's a good family, you're surrounded by respect, by love, and by support. So maybe it's time to, to make this liberal agenda go for family values as well. What do you think? I think one of the, one of the miracles that Ukraine has achieved in its communication or in its relationships is that it's managed to appeal to both conservatives and liberals. Liberals because of, you know, defending democracy and, you know, a Jewish president and and all these other things, but then also conservatives because it's a fight for sovereignty uh, and and the right to be a nation. So so Ukraine has managed to straddle both sides of the both sides of the polarizing divide. Um, And I agree with you. I think it's I think ceding the family metaphor to the far right is stupid. What about the left? And what about the imperialist discourse? Because one of the arguments of Ukraine is that, look, the left is criticizing Western imperialism, but Russia is even worse imperialism. But there's Do always, you think that there's there's always are... been two lefts, haven't there? There's always been a split in the left between the anti-imperial left, which has backed Ukraine, and there's even the new president of Chile, I think, who's a leftist saying, I'm with Ukraine. And there's always been a part of the left which has always been pro-authoritarian, and even though it speaks anti-imperialism, if you scratch it, it's always been pro-authoritarian and pro-imperialist. It just hated its parents a lot and was looking for an even more abusive parent. And it's like, you know, I, th- I think, why I've always been intrigued by one, but I think that's obvious and we know that schism in, in, in you know, in Britain, certainly between the kind of, you know, uh, different parts of the left. Um, but I've always been intrigued in one part of that argument, which is the one, the bit of the left, which says that it wants peace at all costs, that it's for peace. Bertrand Shaw, Bertrand Russell, Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, it has a, you know, I've, I, I named some serious people there in a very stupid one, but, but you know, there's, there's a serious tradition of peace at all costs, peace above freedom, peace above rights, peace above rights. And I've always found that intriguing. I mean, how can you want peace above freedom and peace above rights? And the more I think about it, I wonder whether we can interpret this sort of extreme anti-democratic pacifism as actually being deeply authoritarian. Because if you put peace above everything else, what you're absolutely actually obsessed with is security. We usually think of people obsessed with security on the right, they have guns, they vote for the far right. But this is another way of saying what I respect is security, and the only one who can really give security is the dictator. That's basically the argument of Lukashenko for decades. Yeah. One of the key arguments but, of but Lukashenko you go and tell, was... But you go and tell these guys that actually they have an authoritarian mentality. They think they're liberal and pluralistic. They're not. To yearn for peace over rights and freedoms is actually a covert. Well, not covert. It's actually another way of, of prioritizing security and strength and oppression over, over, over dignity. And they might not like to admit it, but I suspect that they're, that bit of the left's leaning towards authoritarians is not an accident. They like them. They actually want that as well. And they are deeply, deeply, they have a deeply authoritarian psychology in the way that it's defined by George Lakoff or Adorno. It's not an accident. It's not just a logical thing they got to. It's actually, they like Putin. They like? They like him. Okay. They say they don't. They never say they do like him. The far right say they like him. They always, these guys always say, I'm not pro-Putin, I'm anti-anti-Putin. You know? They would never say they like Putin because he's horrible. You know, he's against their values in terms of LGBT or all these causes they support. I don't, I've stopped thinking that's true anymore. I think they like him. 
Uh, let's probably come to the last question, but it's the biggest one. Can Ukraine win this war and what it needs for that, if it can? Everybody's been very, everybody's being very vague in, in defining win <laughs> on all sides. <laughs> so people are keeping their options open because they don't want to commit to what win is. But I can tell you what I think win means. Win means, A, a sovereign Ukraine, Ukraine, but more importantly, well, and that is connected to the idea that Russia stops being a threat. Russia stops being a threat to Ukraine, to its neighbors, to Europe, because there's still only slow recognition in Europe that Russia has control over it through energy. And Russia stops being a threat to the world in terms of food. Russia is a global threat. It has to stop being a threat. To achieve that, Ukraine will have to work with its partners. And we already have the example of the weapons, which is a really interesting moment. People will go back at this and go, whoa, this is a new type of war where, yes, Ukraine is winning. Yes, Ukraine's the one losing people. But without the, san the economic sanctions, which are not very well done yet, but without the economic sanctions and the military supports, you know, it's unclear what would be going on. So this is really about Ukraine working with its partners. And it has to expand from just the military stuff, which needs to build, obviously, to a proper sanctions policy, much more targeted, much more thought through, much more much more effective and clinical with a real understanding of Russia's weak spots. An information policy, which I don't think Ukraine can do on its own either. Ukraine can't pressure South Africa. It has no leverage. Ukraine's partners can. Ukraine can't really leverage Brazil. Some of its partners can. Ukraine can't really coax China into the right decisions. Some of its partners can. So it'll all depend on how this completely new configuration of Ukraine and its partners works out. And it has to go way beyond military to include information, economic, and political leverage. If we can start getting this right, it'll also, first it'll be a completely new type of war, in my mind. I'm not a war historian, but it feels like a very new type of war. Very much a war of globalization, where some can risk fighting or have to fight. Others can do other things, you know, where everyone's trying to work out the angles, how they can take part without blowing up the whole system. And Russia as well from its side. But where everyone's treating it as a war. So from our side, the, the, the partners, I don't care what words we use, but we have to start being at war with Russia. And we don't have to use that word because it's scary in many ways, but as systems, we have to go, we're at war with Russia. It's a war that we're fighting in this weird way. We're not going to risk military war, but we're at war with them. The way they openly think that we're at war, they're at war with us. And we're going to start using our economic, political, and informational leverage in ways that will, that will win this war and that will stop it from being a threat. So we're not quite there yet. Some are. If you talk to people in the corridors of power in some European countries, they're actually there mentally already. But we still haven't, like, we don't have a strategy for that yet. We don't have resources for that yet. And on its side, Ukraine has to work out how it uses the partner as well. So let's take Hungary. Hungary can be dealt with. It'll take a combination of charm and cooperation between Ukraine and Hungary and incredible pressure from Ukraine, Central European allies onto Hungary and very, very powerful investigations from civil society into sanctions, busting, and corruption in Hungary. So those are three different groups who don't actually need to be coming as a united front, but if they were to combine in intentional ways, we could bring Hungary on side, I think. So that's one example. Or we can go on and on and on. So what we're going to have to see for Russia to stop being a threat is this really very 21st century use of partners. And again, we have an example with the weapons. I mean, it's a miracle what's ha happened. I know, it's, I know people complain all the time, and I get why they complain. 
And I know there's not enough, and I completely agree with that. But the way, really, historically, very quickly, we have this incredible coordination of weapons coming in, which you know how much trust that is. Just give a country weapons. Like, that never happens. And again, I know there should be more, and I hate the way that some weapons aren't being given, and I would have given Ukraine planes straight away, all that stuff. But the fact that it's happening, the fact that militaries that didn't really trust each other four months ago are now working together so, so effectively, that gives me hope that we can come up with partnerships that will ensure that Russia stops being a threat. But it's going to be very hard. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We had Peter Pomerantsov, a famous book author <laughs> and a senior fellow at uh, Johns Hopkins University, or author of books like This Is Not Propaganda, Nothing Is True and Everything Is Possible. Those are the only two. <laughs> and uh, other, other fantastic, fantastic articles and texts. Uh, this was Explaining Ukraine uh, podcast by ukraineworld.org. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm chief editor of ukraineworld.org. You can support us on patreon.com slash ukraineworld and uh, follow us and uh, stand with Ukraine.